Hi, I'm Laura Flanders, and this is CityWorks, a production of the City University of New York School of Labor and Urban Studies and CUNY TV. Every month, CityWorks examines an aspect of the lives of working people on the job, at home, or at large in the diverse city that is New York and the greater urban landscape. Today, we welcome Bervi Desai, Executive Director of the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. Ms. Desai heads up an organization of 21,000 people drivers of New York City, yellow cabs, green cabs, black cars, livery cars, and app dispatch drivers. She and others founded the Alliance back in 1998 and in 2011 became the 57th union of the AFL-CIO and the first ever comprised of independent contractors. More on that in a bit. We also welcome Richard Chow. He's a taxi medallion owner since 2006. He now counts himself among the members of the Taxi Workers Alliance. Last year, Mr. Chow joined a hunger strike as part of the Win for Millions in Aid effort. It was a success. Thanks to the activism of these folks and others, each cab driver's debt is set now to be reduced to 170,000 with monthly payments not to exceed $1,122. That may sound like a lot, but it's down from an average driver's debt of half a million. So, Baravi, Richard, welcome to CityWorks and congratulations on what you were able to achieve this past year. Um, it was a lot you were taking on and a lot that you won. Can you just quickly give us the explanation, Baravi, for how this half million in average debt per driver amounted? Where did it come from and why was it such a problem? Sure, thank you so much, Laura. It's so great to be here. Um, so, you know, basically the loans were a result of a lot of predatory practices from the industry, from the lenders, banks, and hedge funds and credit unions through the years, as well as really fundamentally the failure of the city to both regulate these predatory terms, as well as their failure to regulate the entrance of Uber and Lyft. And so, you know, we knew that the prices were already, um, you know, exaggerated. And once the, uh, you know, unregulated competition came in, the prices really dropped. Now, let's be clear, the price that we're talking about is a price for a medallion. That's the little thing that people see in their taxis often. There are only a few of them or there's a limited around a number of them and they have historically cost a bomb. But they've been worth it because people could make money, right? Yeah, I mean, at one point they went up to over a million dollars, right? And the thing that people should know is because they're issued by the city, it's the city of New York that made this money, right? They made over $850 million from these transactions. And, you know, the, the, the lenders, the credit unions and banks made money just from the interest alone. It's only the drivers, the you know owner drivers that have really been suffering because while their revenue came down, the loan amounts, their expenses stayed fixed and in some cases even went up. And so people were literally drowning in debt and in lifelong debt. And because there is a personal guarantee on these loans, it means that when you default, because there's it's it's humanly impossible to keep up these payments, the banks would then seize your medallion and go after you for the rest of that balance. So if you had a house or savings, anything and everything would be at risk. And so people's entire lives were really being ruined. And this is very much created generational debt for entire families, but we've been able to transform that with this victory. Richard, talk about what the debt, first of all, made uh, meant for you and, and your family. Yeah, I'm very glad that we fought very hard and win this uh, victory. And my, I very very happy that and um, we saved my life, my family, my entire family life. And you know, I don't want to left my debt to the kids for the next generation. So, and thanks God, I very glad that 
Uh, I'm an NYTV union member, and we fought that, and we won this. Thank you so much. Well, we're glad you're here, Richard, because Beravi, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember reporting over the years talking about how many taxi drivers under this kind of debt were taking their lives in New York, their own lives. Yes, there were nine driver suicides and Richard's brother Kenny was among the drivers. Richard, I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. Thank you, you want to tell us about Kenny? Yes, um, the Kenny is a very nice and very quiet and um, he I lost my brother, I love him. And when I stopped buying the medallion in 2006, I paid $410,000 from New York City auction. I bought that, I, I bid the auction, I win it, and I make American dream. And as a driver, I make, support my family and my kids and raise my kid, now no, raising my kid, go to the college and and my brother Kenny Chow, he saw me, I'm doing great. I make American dream. And he's trying to, you know, save the money from his, you know, from the sweat, from the blood. And, and uh, he saved the money and he paid the down payment. He bought the, the medallion. He paid $700,000. So after that, the, a few years, and he could do, and he, uh, he said, oh, I'm good, I'm gonna lie, we're making money. And because the medallions went up to $1.1 million. After that, a few years later, oh my God, the city make a terrible mistake, let the Uber and live without buying the medallion. Our revenue so lost more than 50%, and my Varakani, he cannot make money, you know, pay back to the medallion loan. So he's struggling, he's devastated, he lost everything and he's struggling and he committed suicide that, and the Upper East Side and the East River. Mm. So after that, we, um, I, 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 I found out and then I said, not go right, it's not right. So I talked to my brave, I talked to my leader, union leader, bravely to say, this is not right. You get to fight back. You get to, you need a, we need a justice. We need a fairness. Well, you. To you, um, contrary to how it may seem, your motto is not do not organize from the sign behind, <laughs> down, but rather organize and, and organize you have. Um, it's a much longer story. I was there when you were inducted into the AFL-CIO and onto the leadership team, uh, super exciting. Um, and then you come back to New York, 2017, this struggle begins in earnest. Uh, tell us what happened next, what you did, what the drivers did. Um, was there a role for passengers and family to play? And how eventually you decided to take the very grave step of um, many of your drivers going on hunger strike? Sure. So, you know, Laura, it really started around 2016 or 2015 for us. It's been so long now. Um, it started with us going with members to visit their lenders. And some of those conversations were just infuriating and heart wrenching. I mean, I'd sit there where bankers would literally say to drivers, well, you know, I see you have a wife and your wife's not working. What do you mean she's got to take care of the kids? And, um, you know, what do you mean you're only driving six days? Why not the seventh day? You know, I see older guys that are driving seven days. Why not you? And just, I mean, really, there's a real shakedowns. So it's really dehumanizing. Um, from there, you know, we hit the streets. You know, we, we are a militant organization. You know, we live and we die on the streets. And so we uh, had a series of mobilizations where we shut down the Brooklyn Bridge, the 59th Street Bridge. And, you know, uh, we shut down the fronts of lender offices and we blocked streets. And But we also attended every single public hearing. You know, we went to the media, we went to the public. And then eventually we did a camp out outside of City Hall for over um, 30 days. And on the 30th day, we started a hunger strike for 15 days. 
that both uh, Richard and myself and a number of others, I think all together we had about 80 participants in our hunger strike. And what's really amazing, Laura, is it was not only drivers, but there are also elected officials and members of the public, community members, allies who um, went on hunger strike out of pure solidarity with us. It's a huge decision to go on hunger strike because while it's thrown about as a term, when it's engaged as a form of serious resistance, as, as you were engaging in it, it can be also to the death. It was exhausting. And, um, you know, I want to turn it over to Richard because Richard had a lot of pre-existing medical conditions. Richard is the moral leader of our movement and he's our big brother. And we were all so worried about Richard more than anybody else, to be honest with you. Just, yeah, you're so Richard, heroic, you Richard. Talk about, talk about that decision to go on hunger strike. What did you have to weigh up in your mind? And I'm sure there were people who love you and care about you and want you to win who said, please don't do it. Yeah, yeah thank you for, you know, care about me and supporting me, support our union. And during the hunger strike, um, I'm thinking uh, the first day the, the baby told me, uh, we are on us every Friday Zoom meeting. He said, oh, okay, who want to decide to hunger strike? So I, would, I raised my hand first. I registered my name. I'm going to start beginning to the end, no matter how many days. So I decided to fight because of the 6,000 medallion and the, plus their family, their lives are threatening. Uh, because of the, we cannot pay back the loan. So, you know, this is our fight. We needed, uh, we want to fight for the justice. So I decided to make a decision. The first day, the first three days I hunger strike, I'm very heavy, very dizziness, and um, very weak. And, and headaches is the most thing is a headache and hang, very so hungry. Mm. After three days, a little bit less headache, but a little used to it, but uh, like a very weakness. Finally, I I bring, I have a di uh, I have a diabetes, mm -hmm. I have a heart problem, I have a high, high blood pressure. I'm risking my life, my health to fight for this, for this victory. This is very, very glad that we won this victory. And how long did you have to stay on hunger strike, Richard? I, I stayed 15 day hunger strike. I prepared my medication, uh, three week medication. So finally we make it 15 days and we win, we won this. Thank God, thank God. Thank you so much for supporting. Thank well, you so thank much. Thank you for your work because as a passenger in many, many New York taxis, I'm glad that my driver is well fed, well cared for, not exhausted, not suicidal. That's good for all of us. Um, Baravi, this victory has been truly good for your members. Can you just talk about where things stand right now? Have the changes that were won in this struggle actually started being implemented? And just give us a sense of, of what's next for you and, and for the Alliance. Here, and I really quickly, I just want to say there was a wonderful organization called the New York City Docs Coalition, which came out, checked up on us several times each day and really took care of us. So we had a lot, we had medical support through all of this as well. It's not something to be taken lightly. Um, so we've gotten the agreement from the biggest lender in the industry called Marblegate Assets, a private equity firm located in Connecticut. And that was the huge victory that Mar the city of New York agreed to guarantee these loans to remove the personal guarantee from the drivers. Um, and Marblegate agreed in exchange to lower the debts to no more than $170,000 and 1120 to a month, as you said. Now we've got the task of getting all the other lenders on board. The city of New York has already allocated the funding. They did that last year. They've also passed a resolution to continue to fund the guarantee. And on February 8th, there's going to be a public hearing at the Taxi Limousine Commission to codify this fund. Um, 
But meanwhile, we've seen certain lenders, like there is a group called OSK, another hedge fund uh, headquartered in uh, Minnesota, who's been foreclosing on drivers, even in the middle of the night, they have their repo man who follows drivers even to the airports or outside their homes, seizes the, you know, takes the plates off their cars and takes the medallion shield off the vehicle. Um, and it, you know, continues to create this anxiety and insecurity. But I, I tell you one thing, Laura, we know that we are going to prevail for everybody. You know, we said we would not leave these streets until justice was served. And we are a union. It's one for all, all for one. We don't end this campaign. We don't declare a complete victory until every single one of the members affected by this crisis is able to get their life back. And so the struggle continues, the organizing continues, but this time we've got the leverage. We've turned the tables on these lenders and um, you know we're continuing to work with that as we get all of them on board. Are your are you and your members angry at Uber and Lyft? Oh, oh, I mean, everybody's angry at Uber and Lyft. You know, not just the yellow cab drivers, but thousands of our Uber and Lyft members as well. I mean, yeah, I mean, Uber and Lyft, as you know, in 2017, for example, they outspent even Microsoft, Walmart, and Amazon on lobbyists. You know, the Uber and Lyft have been able to essentially monopolize in this industry, not all because of the popularity of the product. That's a misconception. It's been because they've, they've been allowed to enter the market with complete advantages. And they won those advantages by lobbying their way up to the top, right? And so, um, and in the midst of that, there have been driver suicides, not only in New York City, but across the globe. In India and in South Africa, there were Uber drivers who had committed suicide. Among the nine brothers that we lost in New York City to suicide, um, owner drivers, even though they're 2% of the workforce, they were the majority of the drivers we lost. But among the other drivers, there were livery drivers, black car drivers, as well as Uber and Lyft drivers. It's a complete race to the bottom, you know, but we've understood that unless that, you know, for the other drivers, we can fight to uplift the conditions, uh, particularly to win employee status under the laws and stop these companies from misclassifying. But for owner drivers, they have been handcuffed to this debt. And without removing the debt, we could not lift those standards up and you know, get people their lives back. And so this, can, this particular victory is just the new beginning. And event, you know, we have a lot of work to do, not only to wrap up the debt forgiveness for everybody, but essentially to restore the right to a dignified full-time job for professional drivers in this city and across this country. And that absolutely will mean for us taking Uber and Lyft on, you know, directly in terms of their misclassification. You want to see the new leadership of the U.S. labor movement? You're looking at it. Baravi, it's so great to have you with us. And your passion is so clear and strong. The AFL-CIO have been lucky to have you. Have they shown up for you and your organization, your members in this struggle, in this fight? The Central Labor Council locally showed up. A couple of the different unions did show up. Um, but I have to tell you, Laura, that the most, you know, we've been organizing for 25 plus years. This campaign truly was so magical. We had, we had young people that were coming from all across the city on their lunch breaks during work to check up on us. We had high school students after school come by, not for a school report, not because a teacher made them, but because they literally were like, you know, we love our cab drivers. We want to know how you're doing. We had a young woman who came in her lunch hour and said, you know, I've been hungry before. I know what it's like. And I, I just want to know you're safe. This was truly a people's victory. And we haven't mentioned this was all during the COVID pandemic. Richard, I want to end with you. Do you have a message 
to New Yorkers who are, are watching this program? Thank you for your New Yorker supporting, thinking our yellow cab ride. Now, a lot of people, they understand how the yellow cabs are struggling. They're not making money. Now they understand after the, the pandemic and the, we won't, we fight, we won't, the, the forgiveness, um, the people understand supporting me, supporting the yellow cab, supporting the union. Thank you so much, New Yorker. And uh, I want to introduce the most, our, the, the most, I love the, my sign. This is my, I love, I like this. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm glad we got the thank final, you. Thank final you for, word on thank there. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. CityWorks attended a press conference in mid-January outside a public hospital in the Bronx, Jacoby Medical Center. Nurses there, members of the New York State Nurses Association, who work in the emergency room, face severe working conditions, they say. Worse, they're asked to do the impossible, and lives are lost as a result. It's not just COVID's fault either, they said. Joining the nurses were several elected officials. Here's our report. We need to talk about what's going on in our hospital and in hospitals all over the city, the state, and around the country, really. Our emergency rooms are overflowing. Just this week here, we've had upwards of 40 patients waiting for beds. And with the current crisis with COVID, it's just adding more and more of a strain. The ER is overcrowded and it's overrun. We have absolutely no room. And it's not just the ER. The entire hospital is packed to capacity and there are no beds available upstairs. When this happens, the patients suffer. When this happens, the patients end up lying in the hallway for days in the ER, waiting for a bed upstairs to finally open up. This is not an exaggeration. They wait for days. It's hard to believe two years later that we're standing here. Two years later, no progress, same issues saying the same things over and over again, and no one listening to the front line. They are the experts. They know what to do. No one is listening to them. We have to stop normalizing this two-tiered healthcare system where people who have money, people who are wealthy, have care and everybody else suffers. Right. It's not fair to our patients, it's not fair to our communities, and it's not fair to your workers that have been going through this for the past two years, giving it everything that we have and never feeling like it's enough. We're tired of being put in situations where we have to make terrible choices because we don't have resources and we don't have enough people and we don't have enough equipment and we don't have staff. I'm expected to medicate all my admitted patients on time, but oh wait, Bed 9's family member wants an update immediately and the gentleman in the hallway is screaming for a nurse because he can't breathe. But I also have to draw blood on my new patient that just came in with chest pain that needs to be on a cardiac monitor. But oh wait, there's no cardiac monitors left that are, aren't already in use by patients. But also, what just came in? A gunshot wound just came in, just rolled in through the door. And I'm the only nurse in the zone, so I have to respond. And on my way to the resuscitation bay, another, another woman screams out for a nurse because she hasn't been cleaned up all morning, hasn't been fed, and no one has been in to see her. And right as I'm about to walk into that trauma bay, my manager asked me if I had the time to document on my stroke patient that morning. I'm expected to be a med surge nurse, an ICU nurse, a trauma nurse, an ER nurse, a pharmacist, a preceptor, and I simply can't. I can't do it. I wish I could split myself down the middle so I could be all these things at once. I leave my shift exhausted, in tears, and feeling guilty because I know under these working conditions, I cannot possibly provide these patients with the care that they deserve. You know, they're here and they stick it out because they care about this community because they care about their patients. And that's what they're out here in between their exhausting shift to tell all of you. They need help, okay? People gotta wake up. Wake up, people. We need you to stand with us and fight for you because that's what we're out here doing. The first wave, we were there. No PPE, we were there. No more ventilators, we were there. Death beyond belief, we were there. Delta, Delta, we were there. Now Omicron, working short staffed in an ER that's overwhelmed and overrun, being told to come into work while we're sick, we won't be there. We won't be there. 
Look behind me. Half these nurses will not be working in hospitals a year from now if things don't change. And you need to be aware of that. We, we don't triage back rubs anymore. We triage life and death. Who's going to live and who's going to die? Are you going to be the one that we decide you, we can't take care of you? Because that is the reality. We are tired of these false narratives the hospitals are presenting. It is not rosy. It is not optimistic. It is horrific. And there is no such thing as nurse burnout. It's nurse system betrayal. That's right. We have been betrayed by a system. We cannot continue to be stretched so thin. Your nurses deserve better. These patients deserve better. I am tired of feeling like a bad nurse when in reality it's bad working conditions. When you give me all these responsibilities to carry on my back, you then cannot blame me when my back begins to break. We need help. This is my cry for help. We need more nurses. That's our show for today. If you have comments or questions, you can email me at cityworks at slu.cuny.edu. For CityWorks, I'm Laura Flanders. Thanks for joining us.